Artsy is an online art marketplace. This might sound like a simple engineering problem. You just set up a basic e-commerce site, you list some pieces of art, and then you start making money, right? Well, the art world is actually really complicated. There are four major pillars. There's patrons, art fairs, galleries, and auctions. And if you want to bring these different parts of the art ecosystem online, it's actually not trivial. And in order to do so, Artsy has to work with the pre-existing ecosystem. This is not like the taxi industry where you can aggressively compete against the pre-existing businesses. The art world is built around relationships and trust, and the engineering is actually hard too. An art auction is a competition for a transaction for millions of dollars. And in this way, building an auction system is like building a trading system. The latency needs to be really low. You can't make any mistakes or else customers are going to suffer to the tune of millions of dollars. And in today's episode, we discuss all this. Daniel Dubrovkin is the CTO of Artsy, and he joins me for a discussion of the complexities of the art market and the engineering challenges that come with building a software company around it. I hope you enjoy this episode. For years, when I started building a new app, I would use MongoDB. Now, I use MongoDB Atlas. MongoDB Atlas is the easiest way to use MongoDB in the cloud. It's never been easier to hit the ground running. MongoDB Atlas is the only database as a service from the engineers who built MongoDB. The dashboard is simple and intuitive, but it provides all the functionality that you need. The customer service is staffed by people who can respond to your technical questions about Mongo. With continuous backup, VPC peering, monitoring, and security features, MongoDB Atlas gives you everything you need from MongoDB in an easy-to-use service. And you can forget about needing to patch your Mongo instances and keep it up to date, because Atlas automatically updates its version. Check out mongodb.com slash sedaily to get started with MongoDB Atlas and get $10 credit for free. And even if you're already running MongoDB in the cloud, Atlas makes migrating your deployment from another cloud service provider trivial with its live import feature. Get started with a free three-node replica set. No credit card is required. As an exclusive offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners, use code SEDAILY for $10 credit when you're ready to scale up. Go to mongodb.com slash SEDAILY to check it out. And thanks to MongoDB for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It means a whole lot to us. Daniel Dubrovkin is the CTO of Artsy. DB, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having me. Artsy is an art marketplace. And before we get into the engineering of Artsy, I'd like to talk a little bit about the art market because I think that's going to help motivate why this is a fascinating set of problems for a technology company to tackle. I saw a series of videos produced by Artsy on YouTube that described the four aspects of the marketplace of the physical art world. These are patrons, art fairs, galleries, and auctions. Can you describe how these different sides of the marketplace work for the brick and mortar art world? Yeah, it's a fascinating business, but it's also a very interesting and inspiring world as well. The commercial side of the art market is, of course, a big deal, but you know, the world is full of millions of people, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people who are interested in art and who interact with art all the time. And museum attendance has never been as high as it is now, for example. So once you venture in the buying art market, you have a primary market, which is art dealers. So those are galleries and galleries, you can think of galleries as agents that hire artists, maybe fresh out of school, completely unknown, 
and pay them for, let's say, two years to paint and put a show together and then create a real market for the artist by engaging collectors, catering to collector needs, helping collectors find these artists. So that's called the primary market. Then the artist might become maybe more known, the works may have more value, maybe some works will sell at bigger galleries, more prominent ones, maybe they'll exchange hands between private collectors, and then eventually some of these works will make it to auction. And auctions is if you want the public art market, but this is for secondary market works. And that's what you read in newspapers about sometimes where Picasso will sell for hundreds of millions of dollars and things like that. So that's the the essence of the commercial art market. And of course, you have all these players like art fairs, dealers, etc., etc. When Artsy got started, what were the inefficiencies in that brick and mortar art marketplace that you were hoping to be able to fix? So the hardest and the most interesting thing for us was helping people find art that is not available in their physical environment. So for example, if you don't live in a major city in the United States, you actually have very few opportunities to see the fine art world. So what we wanted is to really help with discovery and we wanted to find a way to do that in the, some kind of unique proposition. So Artsy was actually born as something called the Art Genome Project, which is a classification system for art. And it tried to mimic the experience of you walking into a gallery and seeing a curated show put together by an art historian. So maybe a work and similar works by other artists. And then to scale this to literally millions of pieces of art. So it's kind of this infinite exploration, infinite discovery process. So when we're talking about the way that a piece of art's market value is determined, historically this is often done through auctions. What are some of the problems with art auctions? Actually, it's not quite true that the price of works is determined by auctions. Auctions determine kind of the price of works that are at the very high end, I would say. And auctions is one way to sell art. The primary market sells art typically in the $5,000 range by basically inventing that price. They just say this work is worth this much. And if somebody buys, that's now an actual amount that the work has sold so that creates a floor for that price. So if I can sell you something that I call art at a certain price, well, that's what it's worth. Auctions is like a more visible public way of doing that. And auctions are actually a very good and efficient way to to sell art because you have all the information and everything is available to you in a very, very publicly available setting. The only thing I'd say is that auctions traditionally were very much offline. And I think this has changed quite a bit. You know, we work with every single auction house out there and put their auctions online amongst many other things. Prior to Artsy, How was the internet changing the art market? Yeah, it wasn't. I think there were some (laughs) attempts at coming online and they were always geared to commerce. So a company called Artnet has existed for 20 years now and they're the true pioneers of art online, I would say. And they focused primarily on auction data and maybe commerce on top of that. There were other companies that tried to mimic art fairs, like notoriously known VIP Art Fair was a startup that had a lot of technology issues and tried to replicate the offline art fair experience on the internet and has not succeeded at that. And then museums were very reticent to putting works on the internet. So I guess you would find you know, some artworks up there from the museum world, from the gallery world, but it would be pretty spread out. And with Artsy coming in, I think we t- really demonstrated true value of what you can do online when you bring a large data set, a lot of works on the internet. And so it has worked quite well ever since. The mission of Artsy is to make all the world's art accessible to anyone with an internet connection. And one part of fulfilling this goal is to bring the art world online. We've described a complex marketplace, and I'd like to eventually get into the engineering, but I want to spend a little more time just kind of diagnosing this world. What does it mean to bring the art world online? I think it's very similar to bringing anything online. There are aspects to this business that are 
done traditionally with humans and the art kind of the art business is notoriously done with humans and this is great you have art curators historians specialists gallery dealers etc so this is very much a physical aspect of the art world and then there are some basic communication needs like if i want to find the work to buy i'd like to see all the works available that i'm interested in so basic discovery problems and then some inefficiencies so i think the online aspect of it is mostly new and enabled by by the internet and the offline aspects of it will continue being very important and relevant so it's very much like any other market where anything gets exchanged okay there are thousands hundreds of thousands of art pieces for sale on artsy What's the workflow for an artist getting a piece of work online? Yeah, there are actually many hundreds of thousands of and many more that are on the platform that you may not see on the site. So we don't work with artists directly. We engage with their agents, galleries, museums, institutions, and so on. So if you're an artist that is represented by a gallery, your gallery typically subscribes to Artsy for a fee. And they are the ones managing their inventory, all the information about the artworks, and then we help a bit with artist information and stuff like that. So the content that you see on Artsy is actually content that comes from thousands of galleries that are our partners. So we also work with museums, institutions, auction houses alike. So it's really data that's provided by a very, very large and actually the largest network of gallery, museum, institutional partners on the internet. Artsy does not take a commission. What's the business model? So there are three businesses. The first one is one that does not take commission and that's working with, with galleries which upload works and then a collector comes, inquires on the work, connects with the gallery, goes, sees the work at the gallery and hopefully one day buys the work. And we don't take commission from that, but it's a subscription service from galleries. We do take commission from auction houses for anything that we sell. So you can go today on Artsy and bid on a Phillips auction, on a Christie's auction, and so on and so forth. Julian's auction of street art, that's quite awesome. And if a work is going to an Artsy bidder, then we'll take a commission from that. We are also a online publication. Uh, we actually have become the largest online art publication and that's paid for by brands. So we do engagements with brands. For example, right now at the Venice Biennale, we have a project that is sponsored by a large Swiss bank and it's a VR project where artists are making something that has never been seen before. A little bit more on that online later. Hmm. So for the third the third one you mentioned, brands come to you and request some sort of advanced native content? It depends. Think of it as a little bit as advertising. However, we don't advertise the brand's products. We advertise the brand themselves. So in some way, it's, you know, nobody wants to hear about your banking services, but everybody wants to hear about art. So if you can be paying for a vertical on art, say, for us to produce evergreen content, pay writers well and things like that and engage a large amount of people to read about that content you get brand awareness and you get the benefits of that kind of advertising so it's like the a little bit of the high end of advertising because the people who read art content range from you know your school high school students to high net worth individuals and of course most brands like luxury brands tend to sell to high net worth individuals it's the same audience to a large extent Artificial intelligence is dramatically evolving the way that our world works. And to make AI easier and faster, we need new kinds of hardware and software, which is why Intel acquired Nirvana Systems and its platform for deep learning. Intel Nirvana is hiring engineers to help develop a full stack for AI, from chip design to software frameworks. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply for an opening on the team. To learn more about the company, check out the interviews that I've conducted with its engineers. Those are also available at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel. Come build the future with Intel Nirvana. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply now. Do you think 
that advertising is going towards a place where there is more facilitation between creator people and the brands themselves. I'm working on a business around, like a separate business from Software Engineering Daily around user-generated advertising. I think this has been something that people have wanted to do for a while because you know, the idea is you, the current model of a lot of advertising is you have this agency in the middle and the agency brokers a relationship between the brand and the creator and the agency takes a massive cut. So you can imagine a world in which the brand engages more directly with the creator and that middleman gets cut out. Yeah, I can see that. So in, in some ways that's probably is happening, but mostly the brands are now walking quickly away from kind of pay-per-click advertising right? and are trying to get value in these creative engagements and in the experiential aspects of it. I think the middleman, of course, should not be taking large cuts if it provides no value. Uh, so if the only thing that the middleman does is connect the artist to the brand, well, that's not very, very useful. However, if you look <laughs> at agencies or the way Artsy engages with artists and, and brands, that's a, actually a tremendous amount of work. And we produce a large amount of long tail content based on that. So for example, we partnered during the Armory show with Studio Drift, which is an artist that is represented by Pace Gallery and Microsoft and did an experience with Microsoft HoloLens the first time that HoloLens was actually present at an art fair. And Studio Drift produced this piece called Concrete Storm, which are these 20 foot tall virtual columns that were kind of wave, concrete columns waving in the wind. But we also wrote a lot of related content and spent a lot of effort having this content reach a very, very large audience. So while the experience itself is the beachhead of that, there's a lot more to it than just connecting the artist and the brand there. You mentioned this move away from pay-per-click advertising. We've been covering this a lot on Software Engineering Daily, where if you do stuff like pay-per-click or pay for a number of impressions, a lot of times these are susceptible to fraud or just faulty metrics, like just because you have all these third parties that are trying to interact and they're trying to decide on, you know, how much something should be priced and you have potential for intervening poorly aligned players. And so brands are just kind of saying, well, you know what, let's just forget the metrics and just like go to this experiential stuff, this brand advertising. And, you know, we figure maybe we can't measure it very well, but we think that this is this is going to work. Do you think I'm, I'm accurately representing the the change in mood for the brands? I think it goes further than that. If you think of how a brand goes truly viral, it's now increasingly a network of people. So you have to market to influencers in order to reach a very wide audience. You can no longer reach a very wide audience with banners that everybody will click. So what exactly are you measuring? You may have very, very few people click on your ad, but if those are the right people, that those people can truly become advocates for your brand, then you can have this network effect. So products are no longer sold, I think, in this very direct way. And what brands are finding is that that advertising just doesn't work. So they want to find different ways of having customers fall in love with their product as opposed to before where it was just about informing the audience about the product. So I think the, the shift is pretty big and it's the shift in the way that people are choosing what to buy. They want experiences. They don't just want things as much. Mm. There was a discussion you know, for a while that like, oh, you can't really plan or at least this is what I interpreted, that you can't really plan for viral marketing. Like, basically, companies were saying, you know, like, well, we'll take some gambles on stuff, but, you know, we can't plan for viral marketing. There's no way we can manufacture viral marketing. Is there a way to manufacture? I mean, you know, we saw the Pepsi ad recently. Okay, side question. Do you think the Pepsi ad was a success for Pepsi? Well, I, I don't think so, because on one hand, you know, any kind of advertising is good advertising, I suppose. Any kind of publicity is is good publicity. But I think it's it can be also extremely damaging to the brand in the long run. So I think that what's important is that a brand is the hardest thing to create. 
having something out of nothing like that, having something recognizable by a broad public is extremely difficult. And if you can achieve that, that's very long lasting. So I think you may get more Pepsi sold because you'll somehow think about it, but in the long run, it will signal probably a decline. I do think it matters how, how long you measure this and what you want out of it. I just don't think it's simple anymore. It's not just about eyeballs. Yeah, that, that's exactly how I felt about that ad was, and I was just thinking, is this really the best way to spend $5 million or whatever it costs to produce that ad? Like, can't you find some sort of marketing message that's more positive? Anyway, I guess we're, we're, get, we're <laughs> getting off topic here, but so, okay, so you mentioned these three businesses. The first one was this subscription marketplace business where an art gallery can subscribe. You know, I heard this business model similarly on Instacart. Like, this is what Instacart does, where a grocery store like Whole Foods will pay a subscription to have their products indexed online. It's pretty cool because it turns what would be otherwise a marketplace business where it's transaction-based into a subscription business, so your revenue becomes a lot more predictable. So that's interesting. And it aligns interests between the buyer and the intermediary. Oh, of course. Because now your entire value is not the transaction. And the in the art world, you know, think of millions of people interested in looking at your art, but only a few will actually buy. And so you can't have a transactional business there. There is actually a tremendous amount of marketing value as well. Does Artsy handle inventory and logistics and shipping? We don't. And eventually we probably will. But that's something that's handled already by many companies. Now you can imagine in our future where we'll just make that available to our partners through partnerships with many other players there. Are there specific requirements for doing inventory and logistics and shipping for art? Because I can imagine like you need some really high dollar insurance on those pieces of art and you need great care taken to ship it. Yeah, it's it's most art is sold with shipping and insurance to be dealt with later. So you buy a piece and then like, okay, how would you like to ship it? And you call your personal art shipper and they give you a quote and then they come and pick it up and carry it and hang it on your wall. It all depends on the price points, of course. It's just more expensive and handled with more care. Mm -hmm. And these pieces are unique. So, you know, losing a unique work of art is catastrophic compared to losing a non-unique item that can be replaced. Yeah, it's not a commodity. No. It seems like Artsy is fitting into the pre-existing workflows of the art world, but you're also trying to change things. Are there any tensions between these two goals? I'd say we do the former a lot more than we do the latter. We're really trying to find places where we can provide additional value and create new value as opposed to destroy something that's already there. So I think tensions exist, of course. If you look at, if you look in some ways, artsy can be seen as an art fair, but just online. And you would wonder, like, why would the gallery go to an art fair, which is extremely expensive? But I think galleries asking those questions anyway, and Artsy has very little to do with that. So there are some tensions, but overall, I think we are, the reason why we are successful is because we, we take a partnerships model and we try not to compete with anyone in the art world and really find value that we can add to them other than, you know, we're not the disruptors, even though the art market is already being disrupted by the internet itself. Well, it's not like the world of taxis or the world of book sales where you have these entrenched monopolists that are taking rent from the ecosystem as much. It seems like all along art has been funded by patrons ultimately and these patrons are interested in paying money to the artists hanging out with the artists it's been a symbiotic relationship all along rather than the parasitic relationship that you have in things like the taxi industry where you do or the hotel industry where you do have these businesses coming in and quote-unquote disrupting 
Yeah, I think the art market is definitely a exists because there are patrons that buy art, and I think in the future many more people will buy original art. I think it's unlike the taxi industry because the taxi drivers are ultimately more like a necessity than anything else. And you know, once we have autonomous cars, then nobody needs to drive the car anymore. Like everybody is alike. In the art world, the specialists, the galleries, the artists are extremely unique. So if you imagine any business as a graph of relationships, then the art world is extremely heavy on the edges. And there are many, many, many of these edges. While businesses like hotel businesses or taxi businesses are much more, can be centralized for greater efficiency. And everybody wins, except, of course, the people who work in the old scheme of things. So... And yeah, there's of course speculation in the art market. There are mega galleries. There are people who control the art market by buying, selling large amounts of inventory, etc. So you know, it's 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 not necessarily uniform as you might might think. Why are more people going to buy art in the future? Oh, because I hope that people will realize the more and more its value. I think that once you've replaced most human repetitive activity with robots, and once you have things like universal basic income, we're going to have to find something to do. <laughs> and, and I was hoping that would be your answer. And, and we're not going to become <laughs> artists. Artists is just one part of the equation. Mm -hmm. We'll grow the entire ecosystem around. There'll be more artists, but there'll also be more galleries because there'll be more interest in art. There'll be more education. We'll pay attention to, to schools a lot more, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, I think, the bright future as I imagine it. And even the, I think the pessimistic version of the future, I, so by the way, I completely agree with you, but even the pessimistic version where we go to District 9 and we just have like, you know, 5% of the population is just extraordinarily wealthy and 95% of the population is completely unemployed and living in a slum, there probably would be more artistic transactions because the 5% who's just extraordinarily rich just needs something to do. Well, we all speak French at that point, right? It's, uh, <laughs> but I think the actually the more transactions in the art market is something that's happening anyway, because the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting the poor. So the, if you think about people who are able to buy art, there is an increasing amount of people able to buy art. Mm -hmm. And that's happening without kind of positive disruption in the world, right? I'm just thinking that instead of this continuing forever, these two will, th this problem will get fixed and it will get fixed by things like UBI. Yeah. But I think it's, it's in a while, you know, it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but sooner than we think. So today, you know, the statistics are saying for every family that buys art, there's like 250 families that can afford art and don't buy it. I think most people who are listening to this podcast can afford art. Art doesn't cost tens, hundreds, millions of dollars. Most art transacts in the very, very low thousands and you know you pay that for a month of rent. So buying one piece a year or one piece every two years is completely reasonable. And I think the other the other problem is that today we think of art as a luxury and it will, I think, become a little bit more like asset allocation and a little bit less as like buying something that has no value in itself because it, as the market grows, you'll be able to sell it if you don't want it anymore. It will hold its value, its intrinsic value. Right now, it's it only holds value if there is a speculation around it and maybe, you know, you bought something that becomes suddenly extremely successful and goes to auction and then sells mm. for hundreds of times that amount. So I think it will be more like houses and a little bit less like art is sold today. Yeah, it's fascinating. Okay, describe the tech stack for Artsy. <laughs> oh, yes, let's talk about the tech stack. Uh, let's um, talk about, oh, yes, uh, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the art market is very interesting. I, by no means, I'm, I'm not an expert in the art market. Whatever, whatever I may think of it happening, I think there's many, many smarter people that know a lot more than me about it. So, yeah, software engineering, I, I know a tiny bit more than about the art market. So, Artsy is tech stack. We started as your typical Rails monolith, and we peeled off different parts of the system into different services, front ends, back ends, and stuff like that. So when you go to Artsy today, uh, what you see is you know mostly JavaScript set of applications 
And those applications talk to some GraphQL layer most of the time, which itself talks to a bunch of backends, which are services backed with databases that are you know, your typical MongoDBs or Postgres. And then there's a bunch of services on the side that kind of take data in and do something with it and send data back to be rendered maybe somewhere on the front end. So that's, I guess, like the very high level overview of the system. Are you using Kubernetes at all? We are. So we, we've started deploying a lot of services with Kubernetes in the back end. We're still, I'd say, in like a second experimentation phase. We've used, we continue using Heroku quite heavily for our app. So for example, www.rc.net is an LGS app that runs on Heroku. But then for larger things, we've been using Opsworks, AWS Opsworks. And now we primarily standardize on Kubernetes for services and trying to get kind of a grip of this whole large scale system and deploy it in a more uniform way. So we'll end up with Kubernetes 100%, I think. Hosted where? AWS is our default place. You think Kubernetes will be hosted on AWS even in the future? I think so, yeah. I don't see why not. Uh, maybe mm. these things will be re- replaceable. Maybe it will be you know, Google's cloud or whoever else is. It's not, yeah. I don't think that's very important. Like we, We've yeah. been the users of AWS in every single possible way, so we'll continue using that as much sure. as we can. Sure. You mentioned AWS Opsworks. I don't know what that is. Can you tell me what that is? Yeah, it's Opsworks is, you know, you can build a very simple, so it's a service by Amazon. And if you, you could imagine your app has a certain model of, which could be, let's say, a Rails app. You can push it to Heroku and you don't need to worry about anything. And then you say, I want to decompose my app into maybe a load balancer, some backend, some front ends, a database, stuff like that. So you can describe this in Opsworks. And Opsworks is a chef-based environment. So basically, you write chef scripts, and you can describe your entire system that way, and Opsworks runs it, deploys it, upgrades it, and all this kind of stuff. So it's a layer on top of all these primitives that Amazon provides, and the glue is chef. It's like a declarative layer, right? Yeah, if you use chef before, and you wonder, like, what should you do now that you've written all the chef stuff? You know. Where uh-huh. does it go? Okay. Uh, Opsworks could be could be the place, and it gives you tools to do some things, you know. Well, now is that is that something you would want? Even like as you grow to having more and more stuff on Kubernetes, do you need that kind of chef scripting stuff? No, you don't. And I think that's like the key is that now you can build Docker containers on your own machine if you want, or in some kind of pipeline and get rid of a lot of that logic about what that looks like once deployed because Kubernetes does it for you. So by, by all means, this is an older way of doing things. Yeah. And to what degree do you have to pri- do you want to prioritize? I guess it's not, it's not a huge deal probably for, for RTM I'm guessing. I mean, or how big of a priority is it to get your stuff onto Kubernetes, so you have this nice little declarative place that looks like it's the future rather than this sort of legacy system. Well, the way we work is that as we build new things or as we replace existing things, we tend to replace the ingredients and components. And so I'd say the majority of the work today is done in in a way which leverages this kind of new technology. And then the majority of maintenance uses the old stuff, right? Because we don't want to change it yet. So we actively delete systems. We tend to go slower on retrofitting existing systems into something newer, unless we want to do a ton of work in them. So if it's working, we tend to you know, not touch it as much. Like I'd love to have our our front end not be hosted on Heroku for a variety of reasons, but it's not exactly showing like problems. So right. I'm okay with not touching it uh, well, too it's, often. You know, you're you're in a nice place because it's not like a Twitter or an Uber type of business where it's super data intensive and you're gonna have these crazy customer spikes that are unexpected. You probably have a pretty stable, just like slow growth, slow and steady growth where maybe you have spikes in load, but it's mostly due to like back-end cron jobs and stuff like that. I think there are some aspects to this business that are very spiky. For Hmm. example, live auctions are real-time auctions. We had to build systems to allow you to bid under, you know, 100 millisecond round trip. That's a good example of where we've taken and built completely new technology. So if you look at the, you know, we've built a service in Scala to do real-time bidding 
and it's using Akka very heavily. And we built front ends with React and there is Redux and others. So the whole workflow is totally different from the way we've built you know, websites or apps before. It's an event-based system and it's a totally new kind of beast. So where we could get away with building, you know, 60% of Artsy is Ruby and another 60% of Artsy <laughs> is the JavaScript, Node.js, you know, it used to be backbone, stuff like that. That was really a question of like, how do we, how do we change that entire system to support this totally new wild requirement? So I'd say it's, it's quite esoteric in places and, and we've learned from that and we are applying that in many, many other places today. The auctions, are those entirely online or are you synchronizing with some real like in-person auction that's occurring? So the auction is actually occurring physically in the auction house with a person with a hammer and the paintings being carried around. I encourage you to visit. If you are in any big city, go visit an auction. These are usually open with no registration required. You know, Christy, Sotheby's oh. and others. And there's a person with a hammer and then there is a bunch of people that are writing down the numbers. So there's an artsy person that writes down the number onto an app and then we run the auction online in peril. So we bid for you. In a way, it's the same thing as phone bidding. So before you could get an agent who was on the phone and bidding on your behalf in the room. Now we can have one agent for you know millions of people if millions of people were to bid, but at least you know hundreds and thousands of people today that are bidding actively in auctions. We also run the auction beforehand, so before the, there's the actual hammer event. So there is some offline bidding, like eBay style, going on until the auction opens. So we call it you know the last ten feet of the auction are still very manual. And I think it will take a few years till the auction houses let different people integrate with their electronic systems and at various degrees of sophistication today. Some, you know, have them, some don't have really electronic systems, some use like off the shelf stuff. It's all over the place, literally. Catch bugs before your users do with full-stack error monitoring and analytics for developers by Rollbar. With Rollbar's error monitoring, you get the full-stack trace, the context, and the user data to help you find and fix impactful errors super fast. You can integrate Rollbar into your existing workflow, you can send error alerts to Slack or HipChat, or you can automatically create new issues in Jira, Pivotal Tracker, or Trello. Adding any of the Rollbar SDKs is as simple as a single command. Start tracking production errors in minutes. One cool feature is that GitHub repos can be deep linked directly to your stack traces in Rollbar. Go to rollbar.com slash sedaily, sign up, and get the bootstrap plan for free. Used by developers at companies like Heroku, Twilio, Kayak, Zendesk, Twitch, and more. To check out Rollbar, go to rollbar.com slash SE daily. Sign up and get the bootstrap plan for free. Thanks to Rollbar for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. What a strange... I have not profiled any businesses quite like this because you have this social network slash e-commerce platform that's you know if somebody makes a mistake if there's some kind of like minor bug it's not a huge deal right like you can i mean you could probably fix most of those things but then auction that's like real time high sensitivity stuff that you really don't want to mess up yeah and it's, it's ironic because when we started working on live auctions I was trying to build up a new team to, to build this real-time auctions engine. And I had really hard time finding people inside the company who wanted to take on the challenge of building something like this because it was so stressful. And at the same time, I had really no hard time finding these people externally, externally because oh, they yes. liked this new challenge, right? So, uh, and you live in New this, York. Yes, and so there's this, this contrast of auctions are a totally different beast. And we learned to deal with failure in those, sometimes the hard way. I think we've done an exceptional job. We have very, very, very few failures, but it's also because we've built a very robust system. But it, it's, you're right, it's totally stressful and there is one chance to succeed and the sums are high 
and you don't get the second chance. You know, the work will be sold the end. I worked at a trading place in Chicago for five months, and I saw this on the trading side where it's like when the software screws up and millions of dollars of trades are pending, it's just like, oh, my God, it's just complete panic in the room. I mean, not complete panic, but it's like, I mean, there's like an undercurrent of panic. It's like, oh, my God, let's figure this out (laughs) because it's like dangerous. So did you hire somebody from like Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan or somebody who's worked on trading systems? So you're right, actually, trading systems, it's a good point. Trading systems are also auctions most of the time. They're sometimes more complicated, sometimes less complicated. And I'd say the difference is that when the floor stops bidding, everybody stops bidding. Here, the auction house keeps bidding when your system is down. But I went to look, and New York, New York is full of finance companies that have lots of experience with auctions. So I went and met lots and lots of people from every auction type business, financial business out there. And eventually I concluded that a lot of them are still you know, built with paper, scissors, and glue, and that I shouldn't <laughs> be too afraid of, uh, of, of rebuilding these systems. So we didn't hire any specialists that had auction experience. But we certainly learned a lot from people who were working in this area. In the end, we ended up building first an eBay-style offline auction, which had very few real-time requirements. That served us for three years to do benefit auctions and such. And that was extremely simple. And then once we learned from that, we built the live auction system. We did hire and got very lucky to hire somebody who was really knowledgeable in like real-time event-based systems and really designed something much more much more scalable and robust. The paper, scissors, and glue comment is pretty funny because if I recall from my time, and I've spent so, so little time that I may be speaking out of turn, but a lot of times these financial companies have to integrate with like a NASDAQ or just, I mean, you have to integrate because you're playing in this big marketplace. And it's not like integrating with a modern API, like, you know, like a Twilio or some Google Cloud API. It's like integrating with these horrific legacy systems. I mean, you're FTPing text files to banks, right? Right. So this is the state of the art. And I'd say the art world is behind that. They don't quite send pigeons to each other, but there's some of that going on. So yeah, there, this is, there's different levels of precarious technologies out there inside of these like, legacy things that work quite well, but that could be replaced by something much, much better with just a minimum amount of effort. So for a site like Artsy, design is really crucial. I mean, design is crucial for every business these days, but It's especially crucial for an art marketplace. So what's the interaction pattern between the designers who work at Artsy and the engineering team? I love this question. You have to really look at where it comes from first. And we get a lot of compliments on the Artsy design to a point where when the iPhone 6S launched, the Apple person on stage demonstrated Force Touch with the Artsy app. And... People really have complimented us on this. Mm. We've spent a lot of effort, but we actually don't think about it as design. We think about it as something as quality worthy of art. If we are going to display works of art that are going to survive us, our generation and the next generation, it has to be a museum-like experience. You know, there's no, it's not a coincidence that museums are beautiful buildings. They house humanity's legacy. So we wanted to get as close as possible to that. And so we try to design our way out of any kind of heavy presence, right? We wanted less, less is more was the definitely the approach. So we, in the early days, were very heavily design driven where our head of design was always advocating for this value-based quality worthy of art question. And so you'd constantly go around and be like, is this worthy of the art that we're putting? up there. Today, you know, this is bigger, there's more designers, there's more engineers. So we embed engineers and designers and product managers into into collaborative teams and they work like small startups. And so their interaction is is a collabor- is a full-time collaboration and they work together and they each have their own specialties but they comment and bring on all of the other things at the same time. So it's a discussion and ultimately a responsibility of the designers to create something that's beautiful and usable. 
and it's the responsibility of the engineer to create something that is also beautiful and usable but also is scalable and robust and so on and so forth mm -hmm. the product manager's responsibility to build the right thing that customers want so it, it's endless discussions and it's a lot of passionate research and collaboration I take it it's more about that passion, research, and collaboration than it is about A-B testing. Yes, that's right, because not everything can be measured, and you have to rely on a lot of intuition about what is better, right? Because these things are sometimes complicated, and it's not just about the outcome of who clicks where. It's about creating a product that people love, not necessarily about creating a product that people only use. Of course, it has to be usable, but it is about creating something that you can feel something about. And really, it's about the art. If everything else is just a service to the art, then we, we truly win. Yeah, I think this, like this fanaticism for A-B testing sort of gripped the tech world for several years and you know, is really driving so many decisions at companies like Facebook and Google. And I think since then, we're, you know, we're starting to realize, especially with like the stuff came out of the election, where it's like, look at how this stuff can be weaponized. There's a lot of reflection going on around, you know, how do we really want to design this stuff? Because do we really want to design things that make people use a product more and make people click things more, but make people feel sick to their stomach? It's sort of like, you know, the Pepsi ad. It's like, do you really want that kind of advertising? Do you really need to do things that way? Why not design just a more pleasurable experience, even if it lowers engagement a little bit? Well, you know, it's interesting. We, we do A-B testing and all those things, of course, but we're doing them to learn something, to answer questions, not necessarily to build the most efficient product. We really have to think about what KPIs matter, I think, collectively. So for example, for our editorial team, I can certainly get A-B tested into a place where I get more social clicks, right? I can get more engaging titles, BuzzFeed style, where you know, <laughs> this painting sold for $140 million. <laughs> My kid can paint that. And that's like, everybody's going to click on that. So I think that's like on the A-B testing version of things, right? What performs better? However, those users are less engaged and therefore I'm getting more clicks, but I'm getting less of actual value that the brand is paying me for. So we made the KPI of the editorial team engagement and not how many clicks they have. So they strive to maintain a very, very high engagement. And they, of course, measure how many people get to read the whole thing. But if whatever they do reduces engagement, they won't do it. And maybe the A-B tests are around that and not around like how many people click on stuff. So Artsy started, I think you said, or was or in the early days working on this art genome project. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so it's a manual classification system run by art historians. So you have a group of art historians that's kind of having their perfect art historian job, which is to look at art, understand what it's about, and classify it. So they create a dictionary for every single work, and they score genes, and then they create new genes, and this whole taxonomy evolves. So for example, you look at a painting, and you say, this is contemporary feminism, and I think it's you know 75 out of 100 contemporary feminist work. And they do it based not on what they see in terms of image, but in terms of what they know about the work, what they know about the program from the gallery, and so on and so forth. So this manual data set, which is currently you know, many hundreds of thousands of works and many millions of genome entries in a continuous metadata research project that feeds an algorithm, which is a nearest neighbor algorithm, and that shows you similar works by other artists. So in essence, that's what it is. You see a painting, and we show you similar works by other artists. And so that's the main navigation system on Artsy. That's what powers recommendations. That's what makes it actually interesting to browse art on the site. Mm. So Netflix and Spotify and Amazon, I, I know in the early days... And I'm sure to some degree they still do this, but they, they based a lot of their recommendation systems off of collaborative filtering. So, you know, if, if I watch 10 episodes of House of Cards and Netflix is going to recommend those episodes of House of Cards to my friends, not because they're making any specific judgment about the content within House of Cards, just based off the fact that people like me will probably like the same things that I like. 
is there a collaborative filtering component in addition to the you know the categorization because because what you what you outlined in your discussion was like okay you try to figure out the genome of the piece of art like how much feminism does it display like oh okay you you were recently viewing something in feminism let's display more feminist stuff to you i don't know maybe you could give more color on the collaborative filtering versus the categorization matching stuff so the our genome project is something that's not based on your preferences it's based on what the art historian says right so it's it's a data set that is produced in in some ways it's similar to you know pandora maybe a little bit or even spotify so that's a data set that's the same for everyone now the recommendations that we do on top of that it's a combination of our genome data and a little bit of collaborative filtering it depends what your goals are if your goal is to show you similar results to what everybody is looking so a popularity contest and sometimes that can be the goal then collaborative filtering works very well if my goal is to expand your horizons and show you things that are related but kind of further away so you can discover more things then i want something based on data that's done by professionals and not based on your preferences otherwise you end up with like all green artworks that fit your couch and that's definitely not what we want we want an, a discovery engine. We want you to see more, we want you to learn more about art. We think that is what causes you to go from amateur to actually walking into a gallery or museum and maybe one day buying a piece. Not the kind of like everybody likes a specific artist because everybody else likes a specific artist. Mm. So we want you to learn more and discover, not just to buy more. Mm. There are these other platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat where original content, original art is being shared as well as, you know, people talking about, you know, if I go to a museum, of course I'm going to take a picture of what I see at the museum and post it on Instagram. To what degree do you want to integrate with these platforms or are you integrating with them? I think Instagram is really powerful in, in many ways in the art world as a as this, like, what is everybody looking at right now in a big city like New York? It is kind of the entry point of a lot of images into your social graph, and I think that's great. It really encourages people to kind of get up from wherever they were browsing those pictures at and walk to a, a real museum. And I think Artsy is not dissimilar from that, except we come from very different from kind of very different places. So I think we are, we're similar in that way. And then on the other hand, we are a very rich and curated record of all this work. So it's not based on like your friends, it's based on, on the thousands of galleries, museums, and institutions. It's also a permanent body of, of works. And hopefully, you know, the galleries own their materials. So, so often they take their stuff down, but most often than not, they keep it. We just hope that this, this continues growing, and once an artwork is sold, it still is available, findable, searchable, and the information about it lives on the internet forever. You might not be able to see it physically because somebody owns it, but at least you can see its image, similar to how you cannot see the Mona Lisa today because you can't be in Paris. Business-wise, Artsy seems like it has a really big moat because it takes some effort to establish these relationships with galleries or museums or artists. So can you talk more about those those ongoing relationships and do you build back-end tools for these different parties to interact with Artsy? Absolutely. So we, we started the early days of Artsy. We would go and beg galleries and museums to give us some works. Right. Then we demonstrated that the Art Genome Project works and that's something that can only happen on the internet. You cannot replicate the Art project in the real world, you just don't have enough wall space. And most works at the Metropolitan Museum are in the basement and will never be seen because you know, there's just, the, even though the, the museum is big, it's not big enough for all those works to be ever seen. So people really, re it really resonated with them and they saw real value. And so yes, we maintain those relationships at a very high cost. We build a lot of tools for them. We are now, 
building a lot of tools for galleries, trying to show them what works, you know, what has interest, what sells, you know, merchant type tools. And then we're just making the transactions really easy as well over time. So we, we you know, you can collect payment and stuff like that without having to constantly use, you know, wires or whatever other mechanism you had before. And so eventually we'll, we'll probably lower make the transaction fees low and the tools great and the tools are will provide you with the data you need to run your business i think the the software that's out there to run a gallery is way too expensive and one day i hope to be able to tackle this kind of challenges of building like really really cheap software for oh, anyone wow. to open a gallery since oh. there will be many more you know like a hundred bucks a month kind of thing right it's not a not a feasible priority today for me to really focus on that but i think eventually we'll we'll want that and the tools should be available to everyone and the same thing for collectors i think the the tools to manage your collection should be free and so on and so forth it's so funny that it's just like every other established vertical where you have some off the shelf third party solution that was built in like the late nineties or the early two thousands where it's like, you know, art house manager 3000 and it's just way overpriced. And it sounds like, you know, there's a real, real opportunity there. Yeah. There's still museums use systems that like, I'm not kidding when I say they run on DOS. This is still out there. Right. Of course. I think it's very difficult to create a business on tooling like that alone because the revenue opportunity is actually not that big. So I think that's also why there's great systems out there that do inventory, but they're not thriving companies necessarily. Yeah. So on the internet, we're seeing video overtake static images in popularity. And much of the visual art that you see in museums is a static image or a sculpture, or sometimes, I mean, there there are certainly some more dynamic installations. There are things that are like, you know, some sort of wavy material and the wind blows and it makes the material move. But it does seem like there is a real opportunity for video installations and things with robotics and just like a more electronic infusion for art are you starting to see that stuff and and does artsy does artsy index those those types of art so the answer is yes and yes and actually the video art has has been a big deal for decades now in the art world and i think that kinetic sculptures are a big deal too if you go to a good art fair today, you're going to find like a pretty sizable amount of, of these and you find galleries that specialize in that kind of art quite a lot. A lot of this large scale moving art is also making it in the mainstream and is visible all around the world as well. Yeah, and RT has a lot of the still images from those and we've definitely done some video. We've partnered with the moving image, which is an art fair and many others. So you'll find that on RT as well. And a lot of our brand engagements have video components. The one we're doing at the Venice Biennale is actually a 360 video. So, you know, it's not just video, also VR, AR and so on and so forth. So it's totally happening, yes. Cool. Okay, so we're nearing the end of our time. You know, I can envision a lot of the obvious directions for growth for Artsy. I mean, you can grow each of those different verticals that you described. And like, you know, for the for the publishing side of things, you could obviously get into more video content. You could, I could see, you know, that that publishing business getting giant. It could be become a huge vertical, or maybe it's already. It sounds like it's already quite huge. But what are the what are the more grandiose business opportunities for Artsy? Like, what are the things that Artsy is going to be doing in 10 years that would totally surprise me today? Huh. I think they would have to surprise me too. 10 years is a very long time. I think that we hope to really aggregate the entire art world. I think we definitely want to one day work with everyone and everything that engages with the world of art. And I'm not sure what that looks like. I think for now, we are very, very happy to solve some real problems between the players that are here today. And we'll see how how this evolves and what we can do to continue serving the needs of, of the art world at large. I think we're going to find out how people consume, buy, and interact with art over time. 
and that is certainly going to be like big shifts for us because i think that's probably going to change too like it could be that the majority of art is interacted with you know through vr or ar or at least discovered that way and maybe artsy will be maybe our main application will be on hololens and not on the internet on the web mm. so i can just imagine if i can see every single piece in the holographic view artsy will do all the same things but the the main display will not be a jpeg the main display will be a hologram <laughs> and that's like pretty it's a long stretch but i think 20 years ago if i told you that you'll be experiencing your art on your phone you'd, yeah uh, you'd laugh at me yeah so i think that's where the real innovation and change will will come but it will be the same thing right it will just be the devices will change the what art looks like will change but the fact that there are people making art or ais maybe will make art robots will make art and that people want to consume art and learn more about it that's i don't think that will change that's immutable yeah oh man we didn't even get to the ai stuff i was at a google event recently and i was seeing some of the deep dream stuff in person they had printed it out on some high quality paper and it was just oh that stuff is so beautiful it is all right well db thanks for coming on software engineering daily it's been a great conversation my pleasure Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again to Symphono for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily for almost a year now. Your continued support allows us to deliver this content to the listeners on a regular basis. Wow!